Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask for your attention. Thank you. Sehr herzlich willkommen, wie immer, diesmal zum ersten Abend des Schweizerischen Instituts für Auslandforschung in diesem Herbstsemester. Das Wetter ist prächtig, die Weltlage ist es nicht, darüber vielleicht später auch noch ein wenig mehr. Ladies and gentlemen, a very, very warm welcome to all of you. It is wonderful to have you back here at Zurich University with our Swiss Institute for International Studies. A special welcome goes to our guest speaker. Professor Michael Sandel is one of the foremost philosophers of our times. His books, his statements, his lectures, his interventions always deserve the greatest attention. If I would allude to the pop world, I would say he is a superstar. Give him a huge hand. <laughs> This is with hospitality. The topic of Michael Sandel's conference is the tyranny of merit, can we find a common good? The title's question mark already demonstrates the task. Do we have the will, the determination, and the means to make the world a better place? Also, and especially for those, and there are way too many who do not have the opportunities and the preconditions to establish themselves successfully in modern societies. The relationship between equality and inequality, the widening gap between the educated and prosperous on one side, and the left behind without any prospects and little hope on the other side, those are only two aspects of the problem which we should take very seriously. Another question, of course, is can we establish the common good in a more solid way, not only by the contributions and distributions of the welfare state, but also, or maybe even more, by a new mutual responsibility through and within our societies, by a sense for the communities supported by empathy, intelligence, and the readiness for good deeds. Michael Sandel is professor at Harvard University since 1980. His lectures find audiences and online visitors in the millions. Moral philosophy, moral philosophy and Michael Sandel go together as an inseparable equation. Michael Sandel's newest book treats the subject of tonight, the tyranny of merit What's become of the common good? Question mark. The German translation has been published just now. Vom Ende des Gemeinwohls, wie die Leistungsgesellschaft unsere Demokratien zerreißt, published by S. Fischer Publishing House in Frankfurt. Ladies and gentlemen, we are happy to present you a unique opportunity to get into live contact with Professor Sandel. After his lecture, you have the chance to ask questions and discuss with our guest. For now, dear Michael, the floor is entirely yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Meyer, for those generous words of introduction, and thanks to all of you. Our civic life isn't going very well. 
and clouds of doubt hang over the future of democracy. We live in deeply polarized times. And so the question is why? How did this come about? And what might we do about it? The answer I would like to put to you may seem counterintuitive, at least at first glance. As Dr. Meyer said, the English title of the book is The Tyranny of Merit. But that seems a paradox. We normally think of merit as a good thing, as an ideal, an aspiration, worth aiming at. If I need surgery, I want a well-qualified surgeon to perform it. That's merit. If I fly in an airplane, I want a well-qualified pilot to be at the controls. Merit seems a good thing. How could merit become a kind of tyranny? And what does this have to do with the difficult state confronting democracies around the world? What does it have to do with the deep polarization in our societies? That's what I'd like to, those are the questions I'd like to try to answer, and then we'll see what you think. How does merit become a tyranny? Well, to answer that question, let's step back and look at the past four decades. In recent decades, the divide between winners and losers has been deepening, poisoning our politics, setting us apart. This has partly to do with the widening inequalities of income and wealth of recent decades. But it's not only that. It has also to do with the changing attitudes toward success that have accompanied the rising inequalities. Those who have landed on top have come to believe that their success is their own doing, the measure of their merit, and that they therefore deserve the full measure of the bounty that the market bestows upon them, and by implication that those who struggle, those left behind, must deserve their fate as well. This way of thinking about success arises from a seemingly attractive principle, the principle of meritocracy. The principle that says, insofar as chances are equal, the winners deserve their winnings. Now, of course, chances are not truly equal in our societies. We know that. We fall short of the meritocratic ideal. Not everyone has an equal chance to rise. Children born to poor parents tend to stay poor as adults. Affluent parents have figured out how to pass their privileges on to their children. In the United States, we've long contended with higher rates of inequalities of income and wealth than most European countries. But we've comforted ourselves with the following story. In America, we can afford to worry less about inequality than those countries of old Europe, because in America, it's possible to rise. No one is consigned to the class of their birth. Mobility, we told ourselves, is an alternative to equality. But this comforting story about social mobility being an alternative to worrying about inequality, this comforting story no longer fits the facts. It's not easy to rise for those who were born in the bottom 20%, those who were born in poor families. What percentage in the U.S. actually 
will grow up as adults to affluence? Top 20%. What percentage? Fewer than 1 in 12. The OECD studies social mobility in various countries. It found, it asked, how many generations does it take for someone born poor, bottom 20%, to rise, not to the top, but to the middle, to the median income? In Denmark, it takes two generations. In Finland, Norway, and Sweden, it takes three. In Canada, in the Netherlands, it takes four. In the United States, and in Switzerland, it takes five generations. So the American dream of upward mobility is alive and well and living in Copenhagen. <laughs> so we don't live up to the meritocratic principles we profess, that's clear. But there's a deeper problem with the, the meritocratic ideal. The problem is not only do we fail to realize it, but the ideal itself is flawed. It's flawed philosophically, morally, and it also is flawed in terms of the social life that it promotes. First, the philosophical flaw in the meritocratic idea. Let me explain this by putting a question to this audience. Think of the best high school teacher you had, the best teacher you had when you were in school. Probably you can remember that teacher's name. I can. Can, can most of you remember the name? of the most influential teacher you had. Raise your hands if you can, remember. Pretty influential, all right. Now, compare the earnings of that teacher to the earnings of someone who makes a lot of money. Let's take a well-known person who makes a lot of money just for this thought experiment. Athletes often offer good examples. Very successful athletes. Roger Federer, <laughs> who just retired. He's one of my son's greatest heroes. How much does Roger Federer earn in a year? On the tour, but also with endorsements. Does anybody remember? 50 million? 90. It's around, yeah, it's around 90 million dollars, the earnings of Federer. And that was in a year when he was injured. <laughs> now, here's the question. Does, and so what does your teacher make, roughly? $150,000. That's pretty generous. <laughs> You were optimistic, Dr. Meyer was optimistic. I think maybe, maybe 90,000, we'll say, in a well-paid school. So here's the question. Would you say, we can do a survey by a show of hands. Would you say that Roger Federer deserves to make a thousand times more than your best teacher. How many say, yes, he does? Raise your hand. It's the wrong question. Well, first let answer my question, then we'll answer. All right. How many say, yes, he does? Federer does deserve to make a thousand times more. You're not just being sentimental because he's retiring. <laughs> and how many say he doesn't? Ah, all right, we have a division of opinion, but the majority in the hall say that he doesn't. Now, why not? 
Oh, we could, I'd be tempted to call on people here, but we'll have, we'll have discussion at the end. So let me imagine the reasons you might have in mind, those of you who, uh, the majority, who say he doesn't. One reason might be that Federer had all kinds of advantages in terms of his training facilities and his ability to develop his, his gifts. But in principle, in a perfect meritocratic society, we would bring everyone up to the same starting point, which means we would provide genuine equality of opportunity so that everyone would have the same access to great coaches and great equipment and healthy diets and so on. Let's imagine we have that in a perfect meritocratic society. Still, you might say, well, does he deserve to make a thousand times more? You might say, well, maybe not, because generally, the results of luck, we don't consider a matter of, of deserving. If I win the lottery, it's my good luck, but probably wouldn't say I deserve to win. Or if I, if I lost the lottery, I couldn't complain. But I bought a ticket, I deserved it. So the role of luck seems at, odd, at odds with the idea of, being, of, of deserving a certain reward. Well, what luck might have been involved in Roger Federer's ability to make $90 million? For one thing, he's an enormously gifted athlete. And though he trained hard, I could practice tennis 24 hours a day for years and never be, well, never be a good tennis player, never mind uh, as good as Roger Federer. So part of what enables him to make what he does is that he's, he has gifts, athletic gifts in his case, that are not his doing, but instead his good luck. Not only that, There's another element of luck. Isn't, is, it, is it Federer's doing that he lives in a society and at a time when tennis is very popular? If Federer had lived back in Renaissance Florence, he could have been as gifted a tennis player as he is today, but he wouldn't have made such a huge income. They didn't care that much about tennis back then. They cared more about fresco painting. So the coincidence between having certain gifts, certain talents, and there being market demand for them, that too is not his doing, that's his good luck. So, philosophically, there are two reasons to consider that the earnings or rewards that flow to the exercise of talents are not a matter of deservingness. They're a matter of, of luck or indebtedness. So for those two, now these, this point about talents the moral arbitrariness of talents and gifts. This has been made, it's interesting, by two very different, two philosophers of two very different ideological persuasions. John Rawls, a liberal egalitarian, defender of the welfare state, makes this argument when he's saying it's fair to tax the, the successful to help the less successful, in part because the talents that enable the successful to get ahead are not their doing, but their good luck. But he's not the only philosopher who makes that point. Friedrich Hayek made the same argument. Hayek, of course, 
He's not a defender of redistributive taxation. To the contrary, he was the defender of a laissez-faire free market in the name of liberty, but not in the name of merit or desert. Hayek, like Rawls, points out that the fact that my talents and skills happen to be prized in the market and that relatively few people have the talents that I have, that's not my doing. And so it can't give rise to no measure of my merit that that's the case. And so Hayek, too, says that the distribution of income and wealth should not respond to merit. Now, he doesn't say, therefore, we should tax the successful to help those who are unlucky. He uses this argument to disable the claim that because a, your teacher contributes greater, is of greater merit, what they contribute is of greater importance, therefore we should tax Federer or hedge fund managers to redistribute to the teacher. Hayek wants to undermine that argument in the name of merit, the value of the contribution being greater. But they agree, Rawls and Hayek, left and right vis-a-vis -vis the market, that the arbitrariness of talent undermines desert. That's the philosophical, those are the two philosophical objections to the idea that in a perfectly free market, even with equal opportunity, people get what they deserve. But to this, I'd like to add a further argument, which is not strictly speaking philosophical. It's social and political and psychological, and it has to do less with justice than with social esteem. It has to do with the attitudes towards success that I spoke about at the outset. It has to do with the tendency in a meritocracy of the successful to inhale too deeply of their own success, to believe it's their own doing, their due, and to forget the luck and good fortune that helped them on their way, to overlook their indebtedness to those who made their success and achievements possible. Family, teachers, coaches, neighborhood, country, community, the times in which they live. This way of thinking about success, the meritocratic way of thinking about success, brings out its dark side it cultivates a kind of hubris among the winners and a sense of humiliation among those who lose out. Meritocratic hubris matters politically. It's not only morally unattractive, it also deepens the divide between winners and losers and is corrosive of the common good. Now, one way to try to address this divide is to try to level the playing field so that everyone has a truly equal chance to become a winner. But this, even if we could succeed at that, bringing everyone up to the same starting point, this would not heal the inequalities of esteem that meritocracies produce. Why not? Because even if everyone had a truly equal chance to succeed, the divide between winners and losers would persist. In fact, it would deepen. Paradoxically, the closer we come to achieving true equality of opportunity, the more plausible it seems to those who succeed and to those who struggle, the more plausible it seems to believe that the winners have earned their success 
and deserved their rewards. Everyone had an equal chance. What happened to you? This argument against meritocracy was first raised by a British sociologist named Michael Young, who actually coined the term meritocracy. In 1958, Michael Young wrote a book called The Rise of the Meritocracy. Although we have come to regard meritocracy as an ideal, Young, when he coined the term, he considered it a dystopia. He was warning of the hubris that it would breed among the successful and of the demoralization that meritocracy would inflict on those who didn't rise. In recent decades, the meritocratic way of thinking about success gained prominence in public discourse, even as neoliberal versions of globalization brought widening inequality. These two tendencies are connected. The market-driven globalization produced the inequality, but meritocratic ways of interpreting success produced the divide between winners and losers. It is as if the winners of globalization wanted more than the winnings. They wanted to believe, we wanted to believe, uh, that they deserved the outsized share of income and wealth that four decades of deregulation and financialization and neoliberal economic policies brought them. A century ago, the sociologist Max Weber was on to this tendency. He said, the fortunate person is seldom satisfied with the fact of being fortunate. Beyond this, he needs to know that he has a right to his good fortune. He wants to be convinced that he deserves it. And above all, that he deserves it in comparison with others. He wishes to be allowed the belief that the less fortunate also merely experience their due. That was Max Weber. Now, he was reflecting, Weber was, on the religious conviction that success, that worldly success is a sign of God's favor and that suffering is a punishment for sin. A century later, proponents of neoliberal globalization came to see market success as a vindication of merit. So this same structure of thinking persisted in, a secular, in secular societies even after the religious origin of this way of thinking about merit fell away. In recent decades, Mainstream politicians of the center-right and the center-left have responded to the inequalities of the age of globalization by offering those struggling some bracing advice. I call it the rhetoric of rising. In the face of wage stagnation, and the outsourcing of jobs, job loss, confronted by bottom half of the population in many of our societies. The mainstream solution was not to rethink the economic policies that had produced these inequalities, but instead to offer ind individual, oh wait, There's the religious resonance of this secular idea. <laughs> you think universities are exempt from it? <laughs> they offered individual upward mobility through higher education. That was the offer. Here's what they said. If you want to compete and win in the global economy, go to university. What you earn will depend on what you learn. This is a famous phrase, a favorite phrase of Bill Clinton 
What you earn will depend on what you learn. You can make it if you try. This is Barack Obama hundreds of times intoning that mantra. It seems inspiring in a way because it assures, assures us that our future is in our hands. Our fate, our destiny is up to us. And in a market-driven meritocratic society, that means getting a university degree, a prestigious one if possible. Then you too can rise. What these elites missed was the insult implicit in the advice. The insult was this. If you didn't get a university degree, and if you're struggling in the new economy, your failure is your fault. That's the implication. And so it's no wonder that many working people turned against meritocratic elites. Those of us who spend our days in the company of the credentialed can easily forget a simple fact. Most people in our societies do not have a university diploma. Nearly two-thirds do not in the United States, and the figures are similar in most European democracies. Most people do not have a university degree. So it's folly to create an economy that sets as a necessary condition for dignified work and a decent life a university degree that most people don't have. Elites have so valorized a university degree, both as an avenue for advancement and as the basis for social esteem, that they have difficulty understanding the, the hubris a meritocracy can generate. And they have difficulty hearing or sensing the harsh judgment it imposes on those who haven't been to university. These attitudes fueled the resentments, the sense of grievance against elites that Donald Trump exploited in 2016 that the proponents of Brexit drew upon in Britain, and that fuels other forms of right-wing populist backlash against mainstream parties and politicians and elites in countries throughout Europe and much of the world. In fact, when Joe Biden won the Democratic nomination in 2020, he was the first Democratic presidential nominee in 36 years without a, a degree from an Ivy League university. Now, this may have helped him to some degree connect with the blue-collar workers his party struggled to attract in recent years. But the fact that a Democratic presidential candidate from a state university was such a novelty shows how pervasive the credentialist prejudice had become. If meritocratic attitudes towards success have deepened the divide between winners and losers, if individual mobility through higher education is too feeble a response to inequalities of income and wealth, if the rhetoric of rising has become, for many, less a promise than a taunt, what is the alternative? We should begin in thinking about an alternative kind of politics. We should begin by acknowledging that mobility cannot compensate for inequality. Any serious response to the gap between the rich and the rest must reckon directly with inequalities of power and wealth rather than rest content with the project of helping people scramble up a ladder 
whose rungs grow further and further apart. Broadly speaking, we should focus less on arming people for meritocratic competition and focus more on affirming the dignity of work. We should ask what policies would help those who don't inhabit the privileged ranks of the professional classes and ask how they can find work that enables them to support a family, contribute to their community, and, most important of all, that wins social recognition and esteem for doing so. Now, part of the solution requires rethinking the role of higher education. We have cast, during the meritocratic age, higher education as arbiters of opportunity. We've converted universities into sorting machines for a meritocratic society. They are the institutions that confer the credentials and define the merit that a market-driven meritocratic society uh, rewards. But converting universities into sorting machines entrenches inequality. Affluent parents can pass their privilege on to their children, not by bequeathing them vast estates or trust funds, as in the old days, but instead by equipping them to compete in the meritocratic tournament and to win admission to top universities. Let me give you one small example. In the United States at Ivy League universities, despite generous financial aid policies and scholarships, so that anyone from, a, from a, a poor or even middle class family who can't afford the fees is provided not only with free tuition but also room and board, despite these generous financial aid policies. There are more students in these places from families in the top 1% than there are students from families in the entire bottom half of the country combined. Now, it is important to broaden access to higher education. But we also need to lower the stakes of the frenzied competition to get in. And this means investing more than we do in those forms of learning that most people actually rely upon to prepare themselves for the world of work. And this includes community colleges and vocational and technical training here, I think the United States could learn something from the Swiss and German model, which does invest more in uh, apprenticeships and vocational and technical training um, than we do. But there's a further, more pervasive problem. And that has to do with the way the credentialist prejudices are reflected in the way we govern ourselves. We look at the composition of parliaments and Congress in the United States. Now, bear in mind, about two-thirds of our fellow citizens do not have a university degree, and only a tiny, tiny fraction of them are members of parliament or of representative government. 95% of the members of the, U the U.S. House of Representatives and all senators have university degrees. Over half of senators are lawyers and many have advanced degrees. The same is true in Britain and in Europe. And this has led essentially to preventing it's led to a situation where there are very few people from working class backgrounds who serve in elected legislatures. In the Britain's House of Commons, the 
uh, percentage of working class members of parliament is now only 4%. In the United States, working class is defined as people in retail services, manual labor, and so on, roughly half the population. The percent represented in Congress, 2%. In Germany, France, the Netherlands, and Belgium, studies have shown that representative government has become almost exclusively the preserve of the highly credentialed. In the parliaments of these countries, roughly uh, 10 to 15 percent only do not have a university degree, despite the fact that within the societies, about two-thirds do not. It's the virtual absence from government of, graduate, of non-university graduates is a development of the meritocratic age, but it's not unprecedented. In fact, it's more than a little troubling to notice that we have reverted to the way things were before most working people had the right to vote. The highly credentialed profile of today's European parliaments resembles the one that prevailed in the late 19th century when property qualifications were still in effect. In Germany, France, the Netherlands, and Belgium, most members of mid to late 19th century parliaments had university degrees. This changed in the 20th century with the advent of universal suffrage, with the rise of social democratic parties. And from the 1920s to the 1950s, Members of parliament without university degrees accounted for one-third to one-half of legislators. But during recent decades, this changed. And by the 2000s, non-university graduates were as rare in national parliaments and legislatures as they were in the days of aristocrats and landed gentry. Now, you might think that this represents progress. Don't we want well-educated university graduate, graduates to govern us? Just as I wanted that well-qualified surgeon to perform my appendectomy. Why not welcome the fact that most elective representatives attended universities, and often the best ones. Aren't highly credentialed leaders more likely than those with less distinguished credentials to give us sound public policies and reasoned public discourse? No, in a word. Even a cursory glance. I mean, how do you feel that we are being governed these days? Even a cursory glance at the parlous state of public discourse in the U.S. Congress and in the parliaments of Europe should give us pause. Governing well requires practical wisdom. Aristotle called it phronesis. It requires civic virtue. It requires an ability to deliberate about the common good and to pursue it effectively. But these are not qualities that are developed very well in most universities today. And recent historical experience in our politics suggests little correlation between the capacity for political judgment, which involves moral character as well as expertise and the ability to score well on standardized tests. The idea that the best and the brightest, so-called, are better at governing than their less credentialed citizens, fellow citizens, is yet another myth born of meritocratic hubris. So, these are among the questions we need to ask if we are to address the legitimate grievances that have found expression 
in the alarming rise of right-wing, often authoritarian, populist political figures. Now, it's true that part of the appeal of these figures and parties consists of racist, xenophobic, sexist, misogynist political appeal. We saw this with Trump. But it's a mistake to think that the racism and the xenophobia are the only source of appeal of these candidates and these parties. In fact, seeing only that strand of the grievance lets mainstream parties and politicians off the hook too easily. It prevents them from reflecting critically on the role they may have played in putting in place the neoliberal economic policies for four decades that gave rise to the resentments and grievances that paved the way to these figures, to Donald Trump and politicians like him. In rethinking the terms of public discourse, in contending with inequality, we need to reconsider the meritocratic attitudes towards success and the neoliberal conceptions of the common good that have predominated in recent decades. Such a rethinking involves more than familiar debates about how generous or austere the welfare state should be. It requires moving beyond debates about distributive justice only, which is about how to distribute income and opportunity and so on, to consider debates about what I would call contributive justice. Contributive justice is about how to create conditions that enable everyone to contribute to the common good and to win honor and recognition for having done so. Proposals to increase the purchasing power of working class and middle class families or to shore up the safety net. These are important, but they will not by themselves address the anger and the resentment that now run deep. This is because the injury that most animates the grievances that have given rise to these movements is the grievance of working people to their status as producers not only as consumers, only a political agenda that acknowledges this injury can effectively speak to the discontent that roils our politics. Because it's in our role as producers, not consumers, that we contribute to the common good and win social recognition and esteem. Robert F. Kennedy, who for me is a kind of political hero, put it well, half a century ago, this was shortly before he was assassinated, seeking the Democratic nomination for president. He said this, fellowship, community, shared patriotism. These essential values do not come just from buying and consuming goods together. They come from dignified employment at decent pay, the kind of employment that enables us to say, I helped to build this country. I am a participant in its great public ventures. The idea that work draws citizens together in a scheme of contribution and mutual recognition, this, also, this idea also found memorable expression in a speech that Martin Luther King Jr. gave shortly before he was assassinated to a group of striking sanitation workers in Memphis, Tennessee. He put it this way, he said, one day our society will come to respect the sanitation workers if it is to survive. Because the person who picks up our garbage is in the final analysis as significant 
as the physician. For if he doesn't do his job, diseases are rampant. And then he added, all labor has dignity. What would it mean to put contributive justice at the and the dignity of work at the center of political debate? This was, this was discussed, this was debated to some extent in the recent German election, including the debate about the, the increasing the minimum wage. But here are a couple of additional illustrative examples. Suppose we had a public debate about why it is that we, that we tax, generally we tax earnings from labor at a higher rate than we tax earnings from interest and dividends and capital gains. And to, to debate that question, not as a matter of distributive justice, who can bear the burden more, that's important, but also from the standpoint of what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good, and what does it mean truly to honor the dignity of work? Or consider another example, also about tax. But I'm interested here less in the proposal than in the underlying moral argument that it might inject into public life. Consider a financial transactions tax. Even ardent free market enthusiasts would be hard pressed to claim that the social contribution of a high frequency trader is hundreds of times more valuable than that school teacher you were recalling a moment ago. We easily slide into the assumption that the money people make is the measure of their contribution to the common good. But this is a mistake. The thought experiment we did at the beginning puts pressure on that idea. And yet, over the past four decades, roughly speaking, we have slid very easily into that assumption. It's as if we had outsourced our moral judgment about what counts as a valuable contribution to markets. But the verdict of the market on that moral question about what's truly a value, that was put in doubt, at least by the majority in this room, thinking about their teacher and Federer or the hedge fund manager. Taxing financial transactions in order to reduce tax on labor might make the tax system more progressive, but that's not the main point I'm emphasizing here. It would also express society's judgment that work is more valuable than, say, casino-like speculation, which describes much, not all, much of uh, financial uh, activity. And we can discuss, perhaps we will have a lively discussion in the uh, question session, uh, just what portion of financial activity is productive, increases the productive capacity of the economy, and what portion of financial activity simply constitutes essentially a bet on the future value of already existing assets. That's one way of distinguishing productive from arguably not so productive financial activity. But my main point is not to argue for this or that tax policy. My broader point is that renewing the dignity of work requires that we contend with the moral questions underlying our economic arrangements. Questions that the technocratic politics of recent decades have obscured. And one such question is what kinds of work are worthy of recognition and esteem. Another is what do we owe one another as citizens? These two questions are connected because we can't really determine what counts as a contribution worth affirming and honoring without reasoning together and arguing together about the purposes and ends of the common life we share. And we cannot deliberate about the common, common purposes and ends 
without a sense of belonging, without seeing ourselves as members of a community to which we are indebted. Over the past four decades, market-driven globalization and meritocratic conceptions of success taken together have unraveled these moral ties, these civic ties. Global supply chains, capital flows, and the cosmopolitan identities they fostered made us less reliant on our fellow citizens, less grateful for the work they do, and less open to the claims of solidarity. Meritocratic sorting taught us that our success is our own doing. And so it eroded our sense of indebtedness. We are now in the midst of the angry whirlwind that this unraveling produced. To renew our civic life, to find our way to a politics of the common good, we must not only recast the terms of public discourse, we must also repair the social bonds that the age of merit has undone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Again, thank you very much for this very reflective and intense lecture. If you described how it should be, how it could develop into the right directions, I almost thought that you were um, describing Switzerland with or without Federer. But of course, there are other countries in the world which have also uh, another level of problems. Ladies and gentlemen, now this is really the opportunity uh, to ask questions, and I beg you to do so. Uh, the shorter the questions, the shorter the answers. Okay? okay. Then we have a good yeah. distribution and uh, uh, equality among all who sit here. Please. It remains to be seen. Could everybody hear the question? What, what gives me hope that these changes could be made to fend off the dark clouds hovering over democracy? I think it's an open question. And it's a difficult prospect because because it requires uh, rebuilding the moral and civic fabric of our social and political life. And it requires sufficient imagination, political imagination, to recast the terms of public discourse, to address these questions more directly. What the, the dynamic that makes it difficult is that mainstream parties of the center right and the center left have a stake in attributing the sense of grievance not to any policies they created, but simply to racism and xenophobia, that kind of thing. But, uh, and so one thing that has to happen is that the mainstream parties have to be willing to critically re-examine the policies and the public philosophy by which they governed for four decades and acknowledge that they created conditions that, uh, that paved the way for these, um, these dark expressions of grievance. Uh, and that's not easy to do. 
especially at a time when the alternative seems so awful, so deplorable. And we heard that adjective describing Trump's supporters. It's very hard to take that as a moment for critical self-reflection. But that's what the mainstream parties have to do. And they will only do so, I think, if they're prompted and encouraged by citizens, which means that there, has to be, there have to be the kinds of social and civic movements that prompt this kind of rethinking about the economy and the way we regard one another and the way we value the dignity of work and so on. <laughs> Does that mean no hope? It means it's a, it's a, a daunting task. That's a lot of questions up there. Please. Oh, thank you very much. That's, okay. Um, I'm interested in any alignment you see between this project of taking apart meritocracy and the climate and biodiversity crises, where you often can see that the people that are rewarded are often the ones that are causing the most damage. Is there a way that we can find synergies on these mutual projects? I think so. One of the reasons, I think, for the impasse politically on climate change, especially within our societies, is that those who are alarmed by climate change and want to enact transformative policies to deal with it do not listen very well or respectfully to those who are uneasy about those policies and remediations. Instead, there is a tendency to say, follow the science, which means follow us. It's to reassert the authority of expertise and technocratic expertise. We are the ones who can tell you how many degrees uh, the oceans can rise before calamity and apocalypse occur. Trust us. We're the experts. Follow the science. We are the ones who will therefore prescribe the reconfiguration of large swaths of the economy where the experts trust us. But that misses the fact that expertise was discredited and the authority of, te of technocratic expertise was discredited rightly because experts also said if we do out the offshoring of jobs, and if we uh, you know, outsource production to low-wage countries, then everyone will benefit. Trust us. Everyone will benefit. And if we insist on unregulated capital flows across national boundaries, everyone will benefit. Trust us. And, and they said, and by the way, we want to deregulate the financial industry. Derivatives and credit default swaps and all that stuff. They'll, they'll be self-regulating. You don't need government regulation for that. In fact, we're going to peel back. We're going to deregulate the financial industry in Wall Street. And some people said, yeah, but didn't they put that in after the Great Depression to try to tamp down some speculative fervor that could Trust us, we're the experts. We, we, we know about financial innovation. Well, eventually, the political credibility of experts was rightly questioned, more than questioned, it generated anger. And so in some ways, the, now the mantra, follow the science during the pandemic, draws on that same impulse. We know we're credentialed, we're scientists, or we know about science, or we read about science, and therefore, we, you follow our policies. We're the technocrats who know. Well, that generated a backlash. Understandably so, and the backlash is hampering attempts to deal with climate change. So this is why we need to call into question this way of thinking about politics which leans technocratic rather than, and instead to find a way to democratize a discussion of what to do about climate change. There is a lady up there in the last row.
Can you hear me? Okay. Um, could you comment a little bit on how you see the redignifying of work unfold in a very global market where other forces, other cultures are at play? I'm having a documentary such as American Factory in, in my head. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, how is it possible to recreate what you describe in that kind of system where... I mean, even the civil forces vote against uh, unions, establishing unions. Um, I'd be interested in hearing your perspective on this. Well, part of any project to renew the dignity of work would have to strengthen um, collective bargaining and the ability of unions to uh, give voice to working people, not only over the immediate conditions of work, but also more broadly. And during this period of the past four decades, um, certainly in the United States, uh, unions have been decimated, going back to when Ronald Reagan fired the air traffic controllers who were on strike. And union membership has gone down, and measures have been enacted, making it uh, more and more difficult for, uh, for collective bargaining. So that would have to be part of any meaningful attempt to renew the dignity of work, to um, give, find ways, maybe creative ways, of giving working people a voice, not only in the workplace, but also in public life. We haven't heard a critical question from our neoliberal friends here who are well re represented in the first rows. <laughs> they look a little bit concerned, which is actually not so bad. But first, um, Bruno Frey, please. Now the battle starts. Well, wait for the micro, please. To overcome the problems you so beautifully explained, what I, I think it's necessary to have new institutions and not just please to, to do something. New institutions. What do you think of random choice? For instance, a second house of parliament which is totally randomly selected out of the complete uh, population. Well, that's... Uh it's an intriguing suggestion. I, I don't think that people are conforming to the neoliberal label you've placed on, on them. <laughs> Not yet enough, but it will come. <laughs> but I think it's, a, it's an idea worth considering, I think. We um, have a tradition of selecting members of juries in um, Anglo-American law uh, through random selection. And... There, I think there is something to be said for having one House of Parliament be um, uh, selected randomly, or here's a variation which might be easier to enact and to test. There is a growing interest in citizen assemblies where groups of citizens are gathered, sometimes by random means, to deliberate in a structured way about important policy questions, whether it's climate how to deal with climate change or tax policy. And if these citizen assemblies um, are well enough prepared and publicized, and if the media shows the range of arguments that citizens find persuasive in these settings, that could be, um, could become an influence from civil society on legislatures and on governing. And there, there is something to be said for random selection of citizen assemblies, but maybe also for one of two houses of a parliament. In, in part, it's a way of trying to uh, get beyond the tendency of elected parliaments to become captives of the 
financial interests that often dominate in elections. Certainly in my country, that's a, an enormous problem. So that might be one way. Uh, provided safeguards can be put in place to make sure that the random citizens are not themselves bought after being, being chosen. But it's an intriguing idea. Maurice Tufer, I wanted to ask a question. Thank you, Professor. Your considerations, which I liked very much, made me think of the social and moral teaching of the Roman Catholic Church going from Thomas Aquinas up to John Paul II, who, if I'm not mistaken, wrote even an encyclical on the dignity and sanctity yeah. of work. Yes. My question, this church probably, as all other churches, did not understand much of the economy and had little consideration for notions like progress, scientific progresses, uh, knowledge, wealth, well-being, material well-being. My question is the following. How do you reconcile what you call contributed justice mm. with the notion of reward for those who can do more, who perform more, who are right. bigger, yeah. better contributors right. to the general good? How do you right. reconcile those two notions? Yeah, it's a good question. Incentives. Now, I, there are two different moral arguments for... Uh, paying higher rewards to people who perform socially important roles. One is they deserve it. The other is whether or not they deserve it, we want to give them an incentive to be productive in a way that they can. And the arguments I've been making have been directed against the first rationale the deservingness rationale. And so it's, it would still be possible, it would be possible to accept all of the arguments that I've made and still to allow that different jobs and social roles be paid differently. My argument is not that every job must be paid the same, but it's important to bear in mind even if we do, for reasons of incentives for productivity, have some jobs pay more than others, it's important to resist the temptation to infer from that pay difference that the person who gets paid more is more deserving. It's a very easy, natural slide to make from the one to the other. And I mentioned Hayek, who distinguished between merit, which he rejected as a basis for pay differences, and value, which is simply reflecting questions of productivity, the marketability of talents. I think he underestimated the tendency in practice for the one to slide into the other. And so that's a persisting temptation that we need to be alive to, which is not to say we should never pay um, certain jobs more than others. Professor Ernst Fair, and then definitely again the younger generation. So and could I just say, the, there is, a, I agree, there is an overlap, going back to the previous question, with um, the encyclical on work from uh, Pope, uh, Pope John Paul. Yeah, there is an affinity with much, much of what he wrote there. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, you described very well the decline of representative democracy uh, and the ways it, it has been captured by the, the educated. And so one alternative is random selection, but another alternative that already works quite well in this country is giving more, ha having more direct democracy. Hmm. So by having more direct democracy, and I'm al I always wonder about that, that nothing like that pops up in the US or in other countries. Uh, and there are of course many different forms of direct democracy. There can be more dysfunctional ones like in California, but there can also be very functional ones like in Switzerland. And yeah. I think that should be a 
that should be uh, an idea that should yeah. be pursued more in this discourse. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm sympathetic to that idea. I was about to mention California, and then you did. Uh, and California has uh, enacted a, a, a number of unfortunate policies and laws through the referendum. But I think there are ways, and it's worth considering uh, ways, that direct democracy can be um, more than just people registering their preferences. And now online, it seems, the internet seems, would seem to be an ideal platform for uh, asking citizens directly what they think on this or that issue or proposed policy. But that would, if that's all the direct democracy consisted in, then it would miss the element of deliberation and negotiation and persuasion and, and reasoning together and arguing together that, a, that direct democracy at its best uh, enacts. But if we could build in genuinely deliberative components, then I think um, aspects of direct democracy could be energizing and rejuvenating for democracy. Whoever wants, please go ahead. Um, hello. Uh, what do you think the effect of AI would be in the age of meritocracy? Because, uh, you know, we see a lot of different types of AI being developed. And, uh, for example, recently I saw a news that an AI made art won a digital art uh, contest in the internet. And, like, these AIs are getting better and better every day. And maybe the, uh, the value of merit is decreasing because of these technologies. AI producing art that wins an art competition or that sells at Sotheby's. Yeah. <laughs> Not only. <laughs> yeah. Do you doubt that a, a robot could do a great work of art? Yes. Seriously. <laughs> <laughs> why? But why exactly? Oh, that's a complicated explanation. Okay. <laughs> You think you could tell the difference between a work of art produced by a robot and, a, and one by a grandmaster? Um, it's a difficult question, actually, because most of us are laymen, so we don't have really the eye for the differences. Yeah. But what is more interesting, by the way, is there are now comp uh, companies with 3D printers and all of that. They can print works of art even the specialists cannot discern to say this is the copy and this was the original and this is scary. So you all have your Mona Lisa at home and nobody says what an ugly reproduction because it's almost the real thing. Next question, no, please. No, well, I, I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't really, I, yeah, let me try to address. Um, I wanted to get Dr. Meyer in trouble, so I, I delayed answering. But... In some ways, um, AI has been misdirected, the use of AI has been misdirected. Um, and in this reflects the arrangements, the, the uh, economic and political arrangements of the age of meritocracy. Essentially, we've allowed Silicon Valley to determine the direction that AI should take. What should be the priority for AI? Well, the instinct is to replace uh, replace uh, workers in schools or, you know, uh, automated cars, driverless cars, and so on. But maybe there are other more valuable and more productive forms of AI that if we deliberated democratically, rather than leaving it to Silicon Valley libertarians, might actually bring out some truly valuable uses of AI rather than just what it's done so far has been to increase the premium for people with advanced degrees and professional and managerial classes um, and to, to increase the, the premium of their pay relative to uh, working people. But it's a mistake to think that AI necessarily has that consequence. It all depends what, what we take to be the problems 
worth investing in to which AI might be the solution. And so I think we should subject that to public deliberation rather than just leave it to, to Silicon Valley and people who are, who are investing in this. Up there, please. Finally, okay. Um, I have this question uh, to you that when we concentrate so much on work and dignity and honor that it brings, aren't we in a way, I don't want to say fetishize, but I haven't found the right word. Aren't we fetishizing work and leaving out uh, maybe not as many people as two thirds, but some people out there who cannot work because of their disabilities or do not work, right. do not want to work, um, or people who perform other kind of labor that are not recognized as work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also, aren't we staying in this capitalist market system when we concentrate that much on labor um, uh, instead of transforming it into uh, a different thing? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really important question. Thank you for that. And if by work we just mean work that's paid in the labor market, I agree with you. And what I really um, should have made clearer is that contributive justice is not only about paid labor. Contributive justice is about people who contribute to the common good. After all, what is an economy for? Well, we often think product, uh, producing stuff. But for the sake of what? Well, for satisfying consumer preferences. That's the most immediate, uh, obvious assumption. But an economy is actually a, a mechanism for organizing people's productive efforts to contribute to the common good. That's the point. That's what it stands for. And if that's right, then it's not enough to talk about work understood as work compensated on a labor market. Because there are all sorts of valuable contributions to the common good that go unrecognized if we construe work that narrowly. And uh, so I, I agree with that corrective and it helps me clarify the the project that I would like to emphasize, which is about honoring and rewarding and recognizing a range of contributions to the common good, whether or not the labor market uh, properly captures their true value. Thank you for that. Maybe the last question, Francis Schoenewald. Coming, coming. Yeah. Just, I just have a conceptual question of understanding. Don't you just arrive at a different account of merit? Namely, merit is no longer accounted for and deservingness is no longer accounted for in terms of personal success, monetary market success, etc. But it's accounted for uh, according to your contribution to the common good. So the ideal typical teacher deserves merits, esteem and recognition. So it seems to me we're, we're arriving, we're not getting rid of the concept of merit, we're not getting rid of the idea that merit ought to be rewarded, but we're accounting for merit in different terms. Isn't that what it amounts to? Well, in sort of, in very different terms though. Really what the, the broader notion of merit that you're suggesting is implicit in what I've been arguing for would be merit understood not as uh, my market contribution is measured by the labor market, but it would really be civic virtue, and for that matter, virtue generally. I mean, this goes all the way back to Plato's Republic. Plato was a kind of meritocrat, though he didn't quite use that term. Um, and, well, here's, a, here's an analogy. Aristocracy. 
strictly speaking, means rule by the excellent. But we think of aristocracy as being a kind of feudal aristocracy or hereditary aristocracy, where those who are fit to rule are determined by the accident of birth. And we say, well, that's unfair. Mm. That's luck. That's not merit. And so you could make a similar reply to the one that you've made to me by saying, well, the problem with aristocracy then is simply that it's hereditary and that it has to do with who was born to a king or a queen or a, a noble family or a caste. But if instead aristocracy were about true excellence, as Plato and, and Aristotle understood excellence to be excelling in the relevant virtue, and in the case of politics, that means excelling in civic virtue. And that means not just being a good technocrat or expert, but being able to identify with, to identify the common good, to deliberate with fellow citizens, credentialed or not, about what the common good requires, about how to value various contributions, the people who were most excellent at that, who excelled at civic virtue, should ideally have a disproportionate say in governance, even more so than those randomly chosen people. That might be an approximation to get us away from a debased form of, of democracy. And so you might say to such a person, so you're really for aristocracy after all? To which I would say, well, yes, if we're talking about it, and can identify or try to identify an aristocracy of virtue rather than birth. And this, I would say the same in reply to your challenge about meritocracy. If we really do find our way as democratic citizens to meaningful deliberation, deliberation about what counts as a valuable contribution to the common good, and if we des can design institutions that accord honor and recognition, pay but not only pay, honor and recognition to those who excel in the virtues associated with those contributions, well, okay, you could call that, and I, I would accept that as a kind of meritocracy, but it would be as different from our market-defined meritocracy as the aristocracy of virtue is from a hereditary aristocracy where one's place is determined by the accident of birth. So, um, so yes, but that would be quite radically different from what we understand meritocracy to be today. And it would be, uh, it would be well on the way toward the politics of the common good, which is what I'm calling for. Thank you all very Thank much. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thanks. Professor, Professor Sandel, Professor Sandel, you already won our hearts, and that's not always so easy in a Protestant <laughs> city like Zurich. Before we proceed to the ceremony um, of presenting you a gift, I would like to have an eye on the forthcoming conferences and lectures. I hope this works now. On 5th of October, we have Catherine Belton, uh, who, made a who wrote a fantastic book, Putin's People. We are not yet sure if she can safely arrive as things happen in a most unwelcome way sometimes to some people, but we still count on that. Um, a day after that, we have the granddaughter of Nikita Khrushchev, Nina Khrusheva. She is a famous uh, political scientist at an American um, university and a, a fierce uh, lady which will impress us all. Then we have Adam Toos, the historian, on the 18th. And now, then, is another highlight. Sergei Shadan, 
You might have heard of him. He still fights in Ukraine. He's a writer, a musician. He is proposed to get the Nobel Prize. Fantastic young personality. You absolutely have to come. Maybe he also plays uh, a part of his music. Herfried Munkler, I don't have to present anymore. He is a frequent guest at the CIAF. And finally, John L. Kahn, chairman of Stellanis, Ferrari and Exor. Very interesting personality on the topic of sustainability. Now, um, there is a tradition uh, to uh, present a fitting gift to the speaker. Sometimes it works, sometimes less. Um, I hope uh, we hit it. Actually, if I, if, I, if I had known that you believe that bots can produce great works of art, we would have had one here now to no, give you, <laughs> because the principle with this is perception is reality and highly individual. No, um, we have something. Ah, OK. Ayan Hirsi Ali, of course, yes, gets the Schirmacher Prize on the 31st of October and two um, evenings in the Zurich Literatur House. Uh, the program is extremely full. We work day and night, and I think this also earns once an applause. Thank you. So, getting back to the gift. Uh, I think we found something very sweet and, and, and also touching. It's, um, can we show the photo? <laughs> well, gentlemen, your skills have to be improved next time. So, here <laughs> we have an old scale. You know, a balance, a scale, a symbol of justice. Uh, it really works, actually, without the battery or LED or all these new things. And there is a feather on top, but you also can put a manuscript on top or whatever and, and find out about the weight of that. And I think it's also an inspiration if you put it on your bookshelf. And it's always a, rem a remembrance of uh, your stay in Zurich. And anyway, we will provide a professorship for moral philosophy at University of Zurich as soon as it is possible. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.